Hola, bonjour, hello, and welcome to the 18th episode of the Chat It Up podcast. I'm your host, Shooter, and no, I'm not trying to seduce you right now with my bedroom voice. I've uh, caught some sort of a wicked sinus thing, so I do apologize for sounding a little bit under the weather. I will uh, do my best to uh, push through and uh, get through the episode. Uh, If this is your first time listening in, welcome aboard, and for all of you loyal listeners, welcome back. Uh, I've got another great episode for you. Uh, I'm going to be chatting this week with Susan Devine. She's the executive director of the Hiawatha Music Co-op, and we're going to be chatting about a great new winter festival that they are starting up. But before we get into that, um, I want to kick things off with a new segment. I, you know, I've been promising it for the last few episodes, so I don't know if it's uh, like drum roll worthy or not. But uh, this new segment that I'm going to be doing is called Eat It Up. So I'm going to be reviewing places around the UP that I eat at. Uh, I hate the term foodie. Uh, it's just a weird term to me. Uh, but I do love food. And I know a lot of you out there do as well. So uh, I'm going to basically just give you a breakdown of my food experience at certain places and just kind of give you my two cents. Uh, no one is paying me to do these, so it's not like these are sponsored or anything like that. Uh, it's just literally my honest uh, opinion on some food spots around the UP. So for my inaugural Eat It Up segment, uh, I'm going to give the spotlight to a place that's near and dear to my heart, and that's Ralph's Italian Deli. So for those of you unfamiliar, Ralph's Italian Deli is a staple in Ishpeming, Michigan, and they have been for 50 plus years. If you closed your eyes and you picture in your head the quintessential Ma and Pa Italian deli slash shop, uh, this place is textbook. And, um, you know, they obviously they specialize in all things Italian, um, they make very good pizzas. A lot of people rave about their pizzas, but really what they're most known for is their kudagi. And, you know, truth be told, of any place that I could get kudagi in the area, Ralph's has my favorite. Their kudagi is three different styles. You can get it in mild, medium, or spicy. And, but I don't know what the secret is, but just whatever it is about their kudagi, it absolutely hits the spot for me. Um, you know, and I am a bit biased just because it, it is about two blocks from my house, so I will admit that. So I do frequent it quite often, but there's just something about it. Um, you know, they do have, you can dine in there. They do have some tables and some booths, and they have a full restaurant menu if you don't feel like cooking. But honestly, I think the, the biggest thing I enjoy is that I can get everything to go. Uh, typically, when I walk in there, you know, I'll order a fresh pound of kudagi. Uh, they've got fresh buns. They'll slice up mozzarella for me on the spot. They even have their red sauce canned um, to take with. So, you know, it's just one of those things where from the minute you walk in there, you can tell that they put their heart into it. And in the six and a half years that I've, you know, lived close to Ralph's Italian Deli, I've been a pretty loyal customer. And there's not once that I've been in there that I haven't been met with a smile and with great service. So, You know, I'd give them four and a half out of five stars. Uh, You know, they kind of lose a half a point, I guess, because it is a bit on the pricey side for their stuff, as is with a lot of, you know, mom and pop bakeries or delis, that type of thing. But really, at the end of the day, it's definitely worth it for the few extra bucks. So if you're ever in the Ishwing area, be sure to check out Ralph's Italian Deli. Uh, The next segment is uh, the UU Uper News. Um... I saw a few headlines over the last few weeks that really jumped out at me that are definitely unique to God's country. Uh, The first uh, headline is one from last weekend from over on the east end of the UP. It was the uh, 50th annual I-500 snowmobile race. So again, if you're unfamiliar, this race over in the Sioux, it brings in people from all over the country. And it's uh, it's a one-mile track over in Sault Ste. Marie. And snowmobile racers, they uh, do 500 laps on a one-mile loop. And uh, But the big headline grabber wasn't necessarily the, the I-500 race last weekend. It was uh, their attempt at a Guinness World Record. So the Thursday before the race, they had a big parade, and they attempted to set a record for the most snowmobiles in a parade. Uh, the current record is held by Alberta, Canada of 1,047 people. 
And that record still stands, unfortunately, as the uh, the parade in the Sioux brought out 997 people. So they were close, but uh, no cigar. But, you know, uh, a, definitely a valiant effort by our friends over on the East End. And hopefully next year they can give it another try and they can uh, bring the record to the United States. Uh, the other headline that jumped out at me uh, was the CEO of uh, Cleveland Cliffs announced that they're very close to possibly reopening the Empire Mine in Ishpeming. Uh, you know, the mine closed a few years ago and took almost 250 jobs with it, but I guess in a, a conference call to investors last Friday, the uh, the CEO said, and I quote, we are seriously considering increasing our pellet output. We have opportunities. We have one that's actionable as we speak, and that's Empire. We are finalizing our studies to bring back Empire. Remember, we never shut down Empire. We put Empire on indefinite idle. And that means that under the right circumstances, we would bring Empire back. So we still have a few I's to dot and a few T's to cross, but I'm very pleased to inform for the first time actually in a public forum that we are close to announcing the resurgence of Empire. That would be great news for Michigan and for the great people of Michigan. Okay, so obviously it's not a done deal, um, and I'm sure a lot has to kind of fall into place, but hopefully they can get things going there again. It would be awesome for them to, you know, open the empire back up and get some people back working again. So fingers crossed that that can come together, but we will, uh, I guess, time will tell and we shall see, so... Uh, moving on to the next segment, my final segment for the episode, which is uh, This Day in Uper History. Uh, this is brought to you by the awesome folks over at Pasty.com. That's P-A-S-T-Y.com. And they also run the uh, Pasty Central Facebook page. So here it is, your uh, day in Uper history. February 11th, Pasty Central Day in History. At the northern end of Interstate 75, is a span that joins two nations and two cities that bear the same name, Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, and Ontario. While the current International Bridge was constructed in the 1960s, its forerunner was built in the previous century, the International Railroad Bridge, a total of nine spans across the St. Mary's River and Canal system. On this day, in 1887, the partnership agreement was signed that paved the way for building that first structure. Detroit Bridge and Iron Works was awarded the contract for only the draw bridge, while the other eight spans were constructed by the Dominion Bridge Company of Montreal, which half a century later would play a part in building the Golden Gate Bridge. Pasty Central Day in History, February 11th. Okay, once again, thank you to the folks at Pasty.com and the Pasty Central Facebook page. It's uh, about that time for my interview with Susan that I promised you guys earlier. So I guess we will uh, just jump right into it. So hope you all enjoy. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I am here with Susan Devine. Susan is the executive director of the Hiawatha Music Co-op. Susan, thank you for coming on the podcast. I appreciate You're welcome. it. welcome. Yeah, so... Tell me a little bit of about yourself or a little bit of your background. Um, are you from the area originally? Are you from Marquette or are you a born and raised Uper? I'm or? not. My no? husband is. He's okay. a born and raised Uper, but we met in Lower Michigan, so I'm a troll. Um, <laughs> or a I, transplant, A right? transplant, there yeah. <laughs> I've been here since um, 1986, so okay. I've been here a long time. So, sure. you know, um, raised my kids here. My kids are all Upers. Okay. So, for those that may not be aware of what the Hiawatha Music Co-op is, what it, what exactly is is the co-op? So, the Hiawatha Music Co-op is a nonprofit organization that is specifically for showing uh, the community what traditional music is. So, we put on events and uh, we do educational programs, and we have a big festival in the summertime, and it's all about traditional music. So what exactly would you consider traditional music? Well, that's a good question. That's uh, always up for debate. <laughs> sure. And, um, you know, different people have a different um, uh, definition. But for the most part, Hiawatha Music Co-op stays in the tradition of uh, bluegrass, country, blues, Celtic, Irish, singer-songwriters, and folk music. Okay. So how long have you been involved with Hiawatha? 
Well, I've been the d executive director going on eight years. Oh, okay. And but I, my family and myself have been going to the festival since 1987. Oh, wow. Okay. So <laughs> when uh, when the position came up, it was a it was a familiar um, uh, organization to me. Sure. And it, so now. The summer festival, at least, this will be the forty-first year, this correct? Will be the forty-first, right? Yeah. So right. now, obviously, the this co-op isn't really just necessarily just the festival. You mentioned a lot of education and different things. Um, one of the things I found on the website was a scholarship that you guys have been doing the last few years. You, can you talk a little bit well, about that? Well, right. Uh, one of our members um, uh, really loves the Appalachia, Appalachia and music uh, genre sure. and so um, he's been going down to the um, uh, Augusta Heritage uh, School and uh, we started a scholarship for youth mainly we wanted to introduce uh, traditional music from from that uh, area of the country to youth and um, we had just one youth apply and the, the rest of them have been adults oh, and okay. so yeah that um, scholarship is, is kind of been on the back burner for a little while but sure. it's still available and okay. we still hope to have uh, enough money to send some youth to the to the school in the summertime. Sure so obviously being involved with this for as long as you have you must really have a love and a passion for music. I do you know when I lived in um, Kentucky when I was in my early 20s I started going to bluegrass festivals and fell in love with the genre of music and um, so music has been a part of my life um, my entire life I play the fiddle and the guitar and I've oh. been in choirs and so you know this is a real comfortable place for me to be sure what would you say is the most rewarding part of doing what you're doing for Hiawatha you know watching everybody else enjoy the music really is the the biggest joy that I get out of it. Um, it's a family-like atmosphere, the festival. Sure. Um, we have a lot of events where families come um, at, you know, our, our, our Hiawatha on Tap um, series that we have going on right now at the Ordock is family-oriented. And mm -hmm. um, just n knowing that there's going to be generations to come that will continue to love traditional music is really heartwarming. Sure. And now, you know, Obviously, Hiawatha is most well known for your big summer festival that you have every year. But now this year, you're kicking off a new tradition with the Winter Roots Festival, correct? That's right. That's right. We're really excited about this, sure. and um, really happy to be collaborating with so many wonderful other nonprofits in the area. Yeah. Do you want to touch on some, who some of those nonprofits are? Sure. Or some of the well, collaborations you know, the um, the whole idea kind of came about from uh, Dan Truckee, who is the exec the director of the UP or the Balmere UP Heritage Center over at Northern. Okay. And um, he really loves traditional music as well. And um, he thought that it, this area needed some kind of a winter festival, a mm -hmm. winter music festival. Sure. So he um, got together with us and Peter White Public Library, and we brought in Travel Marquette and the Blues Society um, and just kind of sat around and brainstormed what can we do? What, what would be great? Should we start out with a one day event? And and see if we can build on that and it's just kind of taken form. Awesome. So it, this festival is going to be coming up on Saturday, February 23rd, correct? That's right. That's right. Yep. It's going to be an all-day event okay. and um, I should also mention that, you know, Hiawatha had been um, collaborating with the Marquette Symphony um, about the same time that we started to develop the um, the uh, Roots Festival and so it kind of just happened that it all worked out so that we could do it all on the same day mm -hmm. and um, the new um, conductor for the symphony was really excited about the idea of um, having a bluegrass piece played by the orchestra so that's kind of how that all developed into one big day of traditional music. Yeah, that's really interesting. So so if I'm understanding correctly, the Marquette Symphony is going to kind of cap off at the end of the festival. Um, they're they're going to be playing at the end, right? Right. Okay. Right. Yeah, it's a separate ticket, so I, people need to understand that. There's a $10 charge for the uh, festival, and then if you want to see the symphony uh, at the end of the night, then that's a separate ticket. Sure. So if somebody wants to purchase a button to get in, where, where are they able to purchase these? They at? can purchase them here at okay. the Hiawatha Music Co-op office. Uh, okay. We're open Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays from 11 to 5. The Peter White Public Library is also selling them and over at Northern at the Beaumere Heritage Center. 
Okay. What about, um, I'm guessing, obviously, with any sort of festival, you can always use more volunteers, that type of thing. If somebody wanted to get involved and help out, how would they do that? Yeah, they can go on our website and find our email and send us an email and say, I'd like to be involved. We, you know, are a volunteer agency. I'm, you know, the only part-time person. We have another real part-time person. Um, but, yeah. Yeah. Besides the Marquette Symphony, what other type of events or things can people expect at the Winter Roots Festival? Okay, so we have a full day of um, workshops and singer-songwriters. You can go to a dance workshop. Um, you can see some Roots rock groups at the Ordock, and um, we have the, the full lineup of um, different things to do. They're located, so this isn't going to be in just one spot. This right. is basically going to be all over, so Right, speak. exactly. We tried to keep it uh, centrally located to the downtown area because okay. we wanted to support the downtown and make it easy for people to get around. So um, they can start out by going to the workshops at the library, and then um, starting at 1 o'clock, they can stay at the library for some traditional dance workshops. They can go to the commons uh, which is downtown on the corner of 3rd and Spring Street, and then they can also walk over to the ore dock. So it's walking distance all the way around. Sure, and it sounds like there's kind of a little something for everybody. It's family-friendly. It, it's right. You know, for no matter what, it sounds like there's kind of something for right. for everybody yep. to enjoy. Children under the age of 12 are free. Oh, okay. Yep. Great, great. What are some of the bands that are going to be performing at the festival? Yeah, so um, we have, let's see, um, singer-songwriters. We have a ton of them in Marquette, and so we're highlighting some of them. Um, they'll be at the Commons for, uh, starting at 1 o'clock. So we have Troy Graham, who is a local singer-songwriter. Um, he does a lot of um, folk music and traditional music. He does Irish music, and he's a songwriter, too, so you might hear some of his originals. Um, Sue Dumel, she's another um, singer-songwriter. She's going to be doing our workshops on um, singing harmony and, uh, and actually another one called vocal improvisation, which I think will be very interesting. Um, Michael Waite, Carrie Yost, Harry South, um, John Gillette, and Sarah Middlefelt are all great um, folk musicians who are in town, so um, they'll be uh, able to see them at the Commons as well. And then we have some roots rock groups, the the Waylands. Um, the Waylands are um, uh, the Waylands hail from Kentucky. Actually, we're bringing up the um, a group from out of state, um, and they play bluegrass, blues, gospel, folk, and I'm really excited to see them. Our local bluegrass band, uh, Strung Together, mm -hmm. always a good one to see. Yeah, absolutely. And the Union Suits play a lot of uh, bluegrass and folk rock, and then we're going to end that set. These are at the Ordock Brewing Company with the Flat Broke Blues Band, which is always fabulous yeah, to see. Yeah, absolutely. You, you touched on a couple of the workshops. What other sort of workshops um, do you have th that are going to be available? Yep, so starting at 1 o'clock in the community room at the library, we have a contra dance uh, workshop with All Strings Considered, which is another um, uh, string band in the area that um, people really like to see. The Knockabouts will do some Celtic dancing, and uh, UP Gumbo is um, going to do some Cajun dancing, and we'll finish it off with Will um, Kalpala with some Finnish dancing. So lots of dancing, lots of singer-songwriters, lots of folk rock. That's super interesting, though, because it's very hands-on, I guess you could say, because typically when you go to a festival, obviously you're pretty much just listening to music and experiencing bands but with this festival you're actually getting some education and exactly. you're, you're learning how to do some traditional dancing right right so i, I think yep. that's kind of neat because that's not something that you get at a typical festival experience. right right and if you play the ukulele bring your ukulele at 10 o'clock with uh, jeff krebs and uh, you'll learn a few licks from him. <laughs> that's uh, that's interesting as well, too. So, again, it just kind of goes back to there's a little something for everybody at, right. at the festival. So um, is there anything else about the Winter Roots Festival that we haven't touched on that you, you wanted to mention to everybody? Uh, I just encourage everybody to come out. You know, even if you've seen some of the local performers um, and different venues, it's always good to sit down and just enjoy them. Awesome. So my one last question that I have for you is one that I basically ask to everybody, and that would be, how do you like your pasty? 
<laughs> Do you like it with oh. ketchup, <laughs> gravy, or other? Oh, um, definitely ketchup <laughs> and uh, definitely veggie with a spot of cream cheese on the inside. <laughs> okay, that's one of the more interesting answers that I've had for sure. <laughs> Uh, again, Susan, thank you for coming on the podcast. I thank appreciate you, so you sitting much, down and chatting Jack. with me. All right. It's time for the takeaways from my chat with Susan. The first is the importance of trying new things. Susan and the Hiawatha Co-op have built a strong foundation over the last 40 years with their summer music festival. It's very successful and it would be easy for them to rest on their laurels because of that. But this year they're trying something new with this winter festival and they're doing it through collaboration with awesome local organizations. I'm a strong believer it's definitely better to say oh well instead of what if. So don't ever be afraid of new opportunities that present themselves to you. My second takeaway is what a special music scene the Upper Peninsula and particularly the Marquette area has. It's definitely far from your standard bar bands doing cover songs. There's some seriously talented musicians around here. And this actually ties back into my first takeaway. Because the Winter Roots Festival is a new thing that shines a light on these musicians. I mean, where else could you learn dances and experience these traditional music forms? I guess that makes my challenge to all of you listening to get out there to this festival, and to try something new. Because new experiences are the best way to grow. Especially when you can have some fun along the way. Chat It Up is a bi-weekly podcast about all things Upper Peninsula of Michigan. If you're listening on Apple Podcast, please subscribe, rate, and leave me a review. You can also find Chat It Up on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you for listening in. I'm your host, Shooter, reminding you to keep your chin up and your eyes forward.